Matthew chapter 23, the first four verses. The Lord's given me a word that I've titled this afternoon, Burden Binding Bigots. Burden Binding Bigots. It's a little bit of a tongue twister. Amen. Burden Binding Bigots. Matthew 23, verses 1 through 4. I have it on the screen behind me for those in the sanctuary this afternoon. The word of the Lord today reads, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes, and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Going to talk to us for a while today as I say on the topic, burden binding bigots. If you bow your heads with me just for one more moment, Master, save your soon coming King. Father of all humanity, all that is, Creator, we love you today, God, and we're grateful for the word of the Lord. For in the passages and in the pages of this great text, we find instruction for our lives. We find, God, the key to miracles and blessings and divine favor. If only we'll find the courage to live it. Not merely to read it, not merely to hear it preached, but Lord, to live what we see and what we hear. Master, today you've placed a word in my spirit, and I am not able to deliver that word to the people of God in a manner that will bring honor and glory to your name, except for the touch of God, except for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Master, touch your servant today. Help me, Lord, to do the work you've called me to do. For, Lord, the work that you call any man, any woman, to do involving the preaching of the Word of God is a divine exercise. And no one that is called to this work is able to do it alone. We need the work of God. We need the hand of God working with us confirming the word by the Holy Ghost, confirming the word with signs following. Master, in the name of Jesus, send forth your word right now to restore, to save, to heal, to deliver. For we ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen. I've titled my message this afternoon, Burden Binding Bigots at first. I wanted to simply title it Price Gouging Preachers. That was my working title. That's the title I was working under until just a day or so ago. But I felt led to change it a little because I'm not merely talking about preachers today, but all of God's people who enjoy binding burdens upon the backs of others who would try to live for God and who would try to live this Christian life. According to the dictionary, the word bigot is a noun. It is defined as a person who is obstinately or unreasonably attached to a belief, an opinion, or a faction especially one who is prejudiced against or antagonistic toward a person or people on the basis of their membership 
in a particular group. There are many Christians today who fall within this category, and I want to start this message out by making it abundantly clear to you. I'm not just talking about them. I'm talking about us. There are many today who call themselves believers, even in the LGBT community, who are bigoted. They hold to certain beliefs. They hold unreasonably and obstinately to certain opinions concerning groups of people and oftentimes their bias their bigotry is demonstrated in opinions and in beliefs they hold listen to me now toward the church see a bigot is generally somebody who holds to unreasonable, unrealistic, untested opinions concerning certain groups of people. I will tell you, there's a lot of us in our communities today who have opinions and ideas and we love to ascribe them simply to the church. Am I telling the truth? Tell you another one I love. I, I see this online all the time. People love to ascribe certain opinions and certain ideas toward another group of people that I belong to, and that is toward preachers. All preachers are just about money. The only reason preachers preach is because of money. That's the only thing that motivates them. Well, I got news for you today, honey. I've been in ministry for over 35 years. I grew up in the Pentecostal church. The church I grew up in was pastored by men who made a pittance. And I mean they made a pittance. If they were going to support their families and if they were going to be able to drive a decent car and have decent clothes, they had to work a job beside the work of the ministry. And for those of you who are biblically ignorant, I want to fill you in on a little secret today. That is not God's plan for those who do the work of God. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, for those foolish people who want to try to suggest that tithing is not a New Testament principle. It is not a New Testament teaching. Honey, you couldn't be more wrong. You can use that idiotic logic all you want to to explain away your disobedience and your lack of faith and your inability to do what God asks us to do. But the Word of God, the New Testament declares, the Apostle Paul writes, that God hath ordained that they which preach the gospel are to live of the gospel. The entire system of tithing was established in the Old Testament. It was not a matter of law. Nowhere in the Old Testament was it taught that if a child of God refused to tithe that they were going to go to hell or they were going to be condemned, you know, to eternal fire because they refused to tithe. Tithing was not so much a matter of law as it was the system that God ordained and that God established. Listen to me now, because there's a lot of misunderstanding about this and a lot of false teaching in the church. Even in the modern church, there's a lot of misunderstanding. Tithing was not established to support the synagogue. It was not established to support the temple. It was not established to support any buildings or any structures that were part of the kingdom and the work of God. That is not what tithing was designed to do. Tithing was established by God as a means of supporting those Levites who were in ministry positions. The Levite tribe was called to serve in ministry. And the Levites were not to do any other work but the work of 
the ministry, the work of God. For that reason, God said, there has to be some way that those who are in the work of the ministry can eat. There has to be some way they can have homes and they can support their families. They do not have a job that pays them. Therefore, the ministry has to somehow pay them. The ministry, the work of God, has to somehow provide for them. And tithing was established by God as a means of supporting the individuals the people who were in the work of the ministry. Offerings were used to support the temple. If you remember, in the wilderness, as Moses led the people of God out of Egypt, nowhere in that did Moses call for the people of God to tithe in order for them to build and to set up the tabernacle in the wilderness. No, no, tithing does not support such things. That is not what tithing is for. They were called to bring their jewels and their jewelry and those things which were of value and to offer them as a free will offering. Am I telling the truth? And it was those materials that were used to build the tabernacle in the wilderness. The tabernacle as well as the temple were built with offerings. Tithing does not support church plants. It does not support the church campus. It does not support the church building. That is not what tithing was designed to do. It was designed to support the ministry. Paul said, God hath ordained, ordained, that means he has forever established that those who do the work of the ministry, who those who do the work of the word of God and the kingdom of God are to be supported in that work by those to whom they minister. Now my message today is not on tithing, so don't misunderstand me. But I went through all that simply to say to you that there are bigots not only in the fundamentalist church world, not only in the evangelical church world, not only in our society today, people who have obstinate and unreasonable uh, beliefs and opinions concerning certain groups of people. Not only do bigots exist outside of our walls, but there's a lot of bigotry within our walls as well. And we've got to be careful as I preach this message today. I don't want you to hear it simply as, oh, Pastor Charles talking about them over there. No, 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 no. I'm talking about them over there as an example of what we in here need to prevent and what we in here need to avoid and what we in here ought to be striving not to emulate. Am I telling the truth today? I want you to know bigotry is something you find in many people in many circles. Many Christians today are happy to preach to others a message which they themselves are not even trying to live up to. Many so-called Christians will happily lay a burden on you which they themselves are unwilling to carry. They're happy to attach a price to serving the Lord which they themselves are unwilling or unable to pay. How often do we look at others and place requirements or expectations upon them which we ourselves do not even try to embrace or apply to our own lives. I know people who sit around judging and complaining about the actions and conduct of others all the while ignoring the fact that they regularly, consistently do the very things they're complaining about. I used to have a member of my family, she's gone on now. Pentecostal, spirit-filled, 
Oh, I'll tell you, I had the opportunity to live with her for several months, so I got to know her a lot better than I did before living with her. You know the old saying, you never know somebody until you live with them. And boy, I'm going to tell you, this particular family member, she'd sit around and gripe and groan and complain about how this one did that and this one did this. And oh, she'd complain about how other people conducted themselves and did things. And the more I got to know her, the more I realized that everything she complained about were things that I sat there every day and watched her do. And it got to the point where it really was quite aggravated and frustrated, you know, because every single time she'd go on some tirade about other people doing certain things and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, honey, I've watched you do that very thing a dozen times. I've watched you do that very thing over and over again. Who in the world do you think you are to complain or expect? to embrace something and live something that you yourself don't even try to live up to. I, I never once heard her question her own conduct. I never once heard her, you know, question whether or not her expectations of others were perhaps, you know, greater than she ought to be placing upon them. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I'm going to tell you there are a lot of times when I'm having a talk with Tommy and I'm talking about something and I might decide I want to complain a little about something somebody else does, even members of my own family. And I'll complain about something my mother does or something my dad does or something my brother does. And then I'll stop for a minute, won't I, Tommy? And I'll say, well, I, I better be careful because you know what? If I, if I spend any time thinking about it, then I realize I do the same thing. Do you hear what I'm telling you? You see, you've got to be open to that possibility. You've got to be open to that prospect. I love people who think they grow up in an environment of abuse and they grow up in an environment uh, that is less than ideal and they've convinced themselves that they come out unscathed. Oh man, I'll tell you what, bless God, I come out of that unscathed. I come out of that and I'm nothing like my mother. I'm nothing like my dad. I'm nothing like that person or this person. And it cracks me up. I've heard people talk like this. And I'm sitting there and I'm saying, honey, not from where I sit. I know your dad. I know your mom. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of similarity. And some of the very things you gripe about, some of the biggest gripes you have about your parents, your children can have about you. Because you do the same identical things. We need to be careful about putting expectations on others and not ever stepping back and looking and examining ourselves to see whether or not we might possibly be guilty of that same if that same uh, behavior, or that same conduct. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. I'm going to tell you, one of the hardest things in the world to do is to truthfully, honestly, objectively look at yourself. People don't like to go to counseling. People don't like to go to uh preachers for counseling. They don't like to go to marriage counselors. They don't like to go to psychologists or psychiatrists because psychologists and psychiatrists and anybody who knows anything and anybody who's had any training concerning uh, counseling knows that your job is simply to help the individual look more objectively at themselves. See, if you go to a psychologist or you go to a psychiatrist and you think you're going to sit there and gripe and groan about the other guy, you're going to complain about mom or dad, or you're going to complain about grandma or grandpa, or you're going to complain about your husband, or you're going to complain about your kids, I got news for you, honey. Uh, you're going to find out real fast that those people, if they know how to do their job right, they're going to turn a mirror on you, and they're going to have you staring in that mirror, and they're going to be asking you, well, why? Why do you feel the way you do about what mom or dad did or what 
your child does or what your spouse does. Why do you react to that the way you do? Well, wait a minute. I didn't think I was the subject of this examination. I thought they were. Um, they're not in my office. You are. You want me to perform surgery on somebody that's not even in front of me? My mother used to tell me when I was a kid, and it was good advice, I admit. I'll tell you right now, up to this day, it's, it's good advice. She used to tell me all the time when I'd come home, and I'd be upset about something some kid in school said or did or what have you, you know. And my mother would say, honey, you can't change them. You can't change the world. You can't change the way other people act and the other way people do. But you can change you. You can change the way you react to it. You can change the way you respond to it. One of the things I remember her teaching me, and again, mother, you should be happy. I'm giving you a little child rearing pat on the back today. One of the things she taught me as a kid that was good advice was, you know, when somebody comes at you and they say something meant to be hurtful or meant to be uh, offensive, you know, uh, instead of getting all aggravated and frustrated because that's what they're looking for. That's that's what they want. If you just turn around and you look at them and you say something as if their words meant absolutely nothing to you, didn't bother you no kind of way. If you turn around and act like you're in on the joke instead of the butt of the joke, before too long they're going to get tired and they're not going to want to bother with you anymore because they're never getting the reaction they're looking for. I'm going to tell you something. That was good advice, Mother. I started using that. Boy, I'm going to tell you, you want to shut a bully up. You want to shut somebody up who's trying to make fun of you and say nasty things to you. All you got to do is turn around and act like their words just don't mean a thing in the universe to you. They don't bother you no kind of way. If they say, hey there, I like your purse because you're carrying a little bag or something to school, you know, and they're trying to tease you for being sissified, or they're trying to call you a sissy or what have you. Turn around and say, yeah, I've got the shoes and belt to match. See, you act like them words don't mean nothing to you. That, their, their comment doesn't mean nothing to you. If you just turn around and make yourself, you put yourself in the joke, you follow what I'm saying? All of a sudden, you're making a joke out of their joke. You're taking their ha-ha, and you're making something funny out of it for yourself. Once you do that enough times, I'm going to tell you some people get tired of throwing garbage your way because they never get the reaction they're looking for. So the reality is you cannot change. One of the things, I'm going to say this today, probably upset a whole bunch of folks, I don't care. One of the things that annoys the fire out of me about so many within the liberal, as it were, camp, they're constantly trying to change the world. Instead of teaching your children, instead of teaching your kids, how to change themselves so that the, the things that are in the world will not affect them and will not negatively impact them or won't trouble them. Instead of teaching them to take responsibility for the one thing they can change, you get out there and you start going to school board meetings and you start going to teachers and you start complaining to the principal and you start picketing and you start getting on social media complaining about how. Well, they shouldn't do this. We need to create laws. We need to create this. We need to do that. We need to legislate. We need to mandate. We need to blah, 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 blah. And boy, we need to change the world. I get tired of that foolishness, to be honest with you. I really do. And you wonder why there are people on the other side of the aisle, as it were, who really feel like that the uh, the liberal movement, as it were, goes too far, you know, and pushes the envelope. And you wonder why these people get wore out. Well, honey, every single day there is something new. There is another idiocy coming at them. There's another thing we need to change. And and these people will say, well, bless God, we're just trying to make the world better. 
better yet that you may be trying to make the world better, but you're going about it all wrong. If you teach your child to uh, react to things differently so as to quiet their detractors and quiet those who are critical and nasty to them. I'm going to tell you a little secret. If you teach your child that, you're going to accomplish a whole devil of a lot more than if you try to change the world around them. It is going to take decades, if not centuries, to change the world. Am I telling the truth? But it can take a matter of hours or days for a child to kind of revamp their thinking a little bit, to learn to have a sense of humor to learn to respond to things creatively and craftily. Am I telling the truth? Didn't take me long to learn how to react to things differently so that my detractors and those who are trying to be nasty and mean were all of a sudden standing there looking stupid because one minute people were laughing with them and the next minute they were laughing with me. Hello now. Do you understand what I'm telling you now? We need to be careful, folks. The truth of the matter is the only person in this universe you have the power to change is you. But sadly, the one person in the universe that most people spend the least amount of time in uh, looking at and examining is themselves. You know, they're in the medical profession. They teach women how to examine their own breasts so that they can uh, find breast cancer early, am I telling the truth? And they have posters. Uh, when I go to the doctor's office, sometimes I see posters of uh, uh, how to examine your own breast. And if it's a doctor who specializes in male forms, then they have posters of how a man can examine various parts of his own body, looking for uh, potential warning signs of uh, testicular cancer or things of this nature. And the best thing you'll ever learn how to do is examine yourself. But that is something most people don't want to do. It's too painful. It's too difficult. I don't want to have to admit that there's a weakness in me. I don't want to have to admit that something I hated about my mother, I do myself. Something I despised about my dad, I I do things that way myself. I don't want to have to admit that. I don't want to have to see that. I don't want to have to acknowledge that. It's easier for me to live in the state of denial and convince myself that I came through my upbringing unscathed and unaffected. Bless God. Uh, got news for you, honey. The Bible said the sins of the Father are visited under the third... Uh, third and the fourth, fourth and the fifth generation, uh, the chances you come out of it unscathed and unaffected are very slim. Listen, in Luke chapter 11, verse 46, the Lord Jesus Christ said, and he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for ye laid men with burdens grievous to be borne. And ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. In Matthew 23, verse 13, our primary text was verses 1 through 4, Matthew 23. But if you go down to verse 13, the word of the Lord said, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. I'm going to tell you, I know too many Christians who not only do they not make any effort to live the Christian life and to do this thing God's way, but they go out of their way to try to convince others not to do it God's way and not to live this thing right either. Am I telling the truth? Oh, they live angry. They live bitter. They live holding grudges. They live hating certain groups of people and certain types of people. And by God, they want to make everybody around them do things the way they do it rather than the way God would have it done. Am I telling the truth today, folks? Oh, I'm going to tell you, we better be careful about this kind of behavior. We are not today 
immune to conducting ourselves in this fashion. For instance, today, many in the church world say that having homosexual impulses is not a sin. Oh, they're so understanding. But acting on them is. These same people do not regard sexual impulses after divorce as being prohibited. They do not suggest that those who are divorced are prohibited by Scripture from remarriage and therefore they too ought to pursue celibate lives devoid of companionship and intimacy. But you want to know what? That's exactly what the Bible says. And that is exactly what the law of Moses taught us. In Leviticus 20 and verse 10, the law said, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Isn't it funny how there are people in the church world, there are preachers out there today preaching that homosexuals should be stoned to death just like the Bible says they should. Um, got news for you, stupid. It also says that adulterers and adulteresses should be stoned to death. My Lord, that would include some of our most popular political figures. Why, Rush Limbaugh, he'd have been dead long before he spewed all that hate and negativity and nastiness into American society. Newt Gingrich, dead and buried. He'd be out of the picture. I could go down a list a mile long if you knew how many of our lawmakers in Washington are men and women who knowingly have committed adultery, many of which have been divorced by their spouses because of adultery. And yet in the Word of God, the law of Moses said an adulterer and adulteress, they both should be stoned to death, am I telling the truth? But see how easy it is for bigots to put a load on you and I that they're not willing themselves to carry? You say, well, Pastor, a moment ago you were talking about divorce and remarriage, and now all of a sudden you're talking about adulterers and adulteresses. I think you lost track. Oh, no, I didn't lose track at all. I know exactly where I'm going. You see, according to the Word of God, an individual who is divorced and who then proceeds to remarry or enter into a sexual relationship with a new partner, according to the law of Moses, according to the Word of God, they're committing adultery. Because while the law of Moses allowed for a divorce to take place, so that a woman could be released from a bad marriage, for instance, uh, or an adulterous marriage, it did not permit remarriage. Jesus went on to tell us later, and I'm going to share that passage momentarily, he went on to tell us later concerning divorce. I'll, you know what, I'll say that till then. Let me do that or else I'll be repeating myself in a minute. Among other things, the Bible clearly teaches that one who divorces, remarries, or has intercourse with another partner, listen, and then goes back and remarries their original spouse, as Elizabeth Taylor did with Richard Burton, for example, that one who does this commits an abomination. If you read Deuteronomy 24 and 4, her former husband which sent her away may not take her again to be his wife. After that she is defiled. For that is abomination before the Lord. And thou shalt not cause the land to sin which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an, for an inheritance. Adultery is also an abomination before the Lord. But no one is trying to bring adult trying to bring adultery laws back. 
You get a new mic. This one's starting to fade on me, I think, a little bit. No one's trying to bring adultery laws back. Nobody wants to make it so that men and women can be jailed for the crime of adultery. As was once the law, listen to me, in every state in the United States of America. There's an article, you can find it online, from Salon Magazine concerning the issue of adultery and fornication. The byline on this article reads, Why are states rushing to get these outdated laws off the books? Outdated laws, adultery and fornication. At least seven states are working to amend or repeal outdated sex laws. Why? Take a look at the Supreme Court. This article was published on May 6th of 2019. 2019, that's not very long ago. And there were seven states at that time that were seeking to revise laws and repeal laws related to adultery and fornication. Wikipedia has an article relative to adultery laws in the United States uh, and the various states of the United States. Listen to this. The United States is one of few industrialized countries to have laws criminalizing adultery. In the United States, laws vary from state to state. Until the mid-20th century, most U.S. states, especially southern and northeastern states, had laws against fornication, adultery, even cohabitation. These laws have gradually been abolished or struck down by courts as unconstitutional. State criminal laws against adultery today are rarely enforced. Federal appeals courts have ruled inconsistently as to whether these laws are unconstitutional, especially after a 2003 Supreme Court decision. As of 2019, the Supreme Court has not ruled directly on the issue. As of 2021, adultery is a, cri a criminal offense, listen to me, in 17 states. That's as of right now. Adultery is illegal in 17 states. Listen to the next phrase. But prosecutions are rare. One state abolished its fornication and adultery laws in 1973. Other states have decriminalized adultery in more recent years, including 2010, 2013, 2014, 2018, and 2019. Laws against adultery have been named, listen, as invasive and incompatible with principles of liberty. Much of the criticism comes uh, from consensus among those uh, whose adherence suggests that government must not intrude into daily personal lives and that such disputes are to be settled privately rather than in the courts and publicly. It is also argued that adultery laws, listen to me, are rooted in religious doctrines which should not be the case. And it should not be permitted because after all, these laws are based on religious belief and religious doctrines. Opponents of adultery laws regard them, listen, th this is from Wikipedia, regard them as painfully archaic, believing they represent sanctions reminiscent of 19th century novels. 
They further object to the legislation of morality, especially a morality so steeped in religious doctrine. Support for the preservation of the adultery laws comes from religious groups and from political parties who feel quite independent of morality, that the government has reason to concern itself with the consensual sexual activity of its citizens. The crucial question is, when, if ever, is the government justified to interfere in consensual bedroom affairs? Now, I'm talking about people who like to put burdens on others, but they wouldn't touch that burden with a hundred foot pole. Isn't it funny how we got all these lawmakers and we got all these people who are more than happy to come against LGBT communities, people, they're more than happy to come between consensual gay lesbian relationships, but they want you to keep your hands off of their uh, heterosexual sexual sexual conduct even when it is adulterous even when it is extramarital even when it is hurting families and hurting wives even when it is causing husbands to bring home communicable diseases to their wives and wives to their husbands you hear what I'm telling you now isn't it funny how when it applies to them, all of a sudden it's all hands off, but when it applies to you, oh, they're all for it. We got preachers out there preaching that people who are gay and lesbians should be stoned like they were in the Bible, but nowhere do you hear these preachers saying that those who commit adultery should be stoned. Well, of course not. For one thing, because the Word of God teaches, as I'm going to share with you in a moment, that a man or a woman who's divorced and remarries has entered into an adulterous relationship. A divorce only dissolves a marriage in civil law. It does not dissolve that marriage in the eyes of God. The Roman Catholic Church to this day still says that, still teaches that. The only gimmick they have is uh, you can be married for, you know, 25 years and have 13 kids and the Pope can still annul your marriage. So you're not divorced, you're annulled, which is foolishness because no marriage in biblical terms can be annulled if it has already been sexually uh, Consummated, amen. All right. Now listen, there are some famous preachers in America who have been divorced. There are many who have been divorced and remarried. I was surprised to learn that one of the most famous among us today is Charles Stanley, who once served as the head of the Southern Baptist Convention. I did not know until I was doing research for this message today. I did not know that his wife divorced him in 2000, although she legally separated from him. In 1993, there were no accusations of adultery. There were no accusations of extramarital affairs. By the way, none of the people I'm about to mention, I am not speaking of them as a means of judgment. I'm not speaking of them in terms of uh, trying to be judgmental or critical. Uh, I am speaking of them, quite frankly, as an example. All right, and I'm referring to the hypocrisy of the bigot who can preach against one group of people all the while they wouldn't touch the very thing they require of you and I, they wouldn't touch with a hundred foot pole. Charles Stanley's wife divorced him in 2000. His church voted that they would retain him as pastor even though he had been divorced. But listen to me, children. For those of you who think that what I'm saying about divorce and remarriage is not something that's believed in the Christian community. His church said, yes, you can remain our pastor so long as you do not remarry. He retired in 2020. Bishop Eddie Long had two wives. 
He was married the first time from 1990 to 2017. Then he was married a second time, uh, uh, the first time from 1981 to 1985. Then he was married the second time from 1990 to 2017. I got news for you, children. The Word of God would call him an adulterer. John Hagee. Oh my goodness. One of the most homophobic, bigoted preachers on the planet was married from 1960 to 1975 when he was divorced. He then remarried the year after in 1976. And the wife he is married to today is his second wife. John Hagee, in the eyes of God, according to the same law he uses to condemn the gay and lesbian community, John Hagee is an adulterer. Richard Roberts, son of the late Oral Roberts. I remember when Richard Roberts uh, was first married, and then he divorced. He divorced his first wife, Patty Thompson, back in the, as I recall, it was the early 80s, and he is now married to a woman named Lindsay Roberts, and they've been married now for, you know, some 30 some odd years. According to the Word of God, according to the Old Testament law, Richard Roberts would be an adulterer. Jim Baker, oh yes, former wife Tammy Faye. Tammy Faye and he were married from 1961 to 1992. He then remarried his present wife in 1998. While he has no problem speaking of the immorality and the ungodliness of the gay lesbian community, he does not for one moment stop and consider that the word of God labels him an adulterer. Oh my, President Trump's personal preacher, the wonderful Paula White. Married from 1990 to 2007 to her first husband. They divorced. She remarried in 2015. Lastly, again, as an example, I'm not condemning these people. I'm not criticizing these people. As the old saying goes, but for the grace of God, there go I. I cannot criticize them. I'm no better than they are. They're no worse than I am. But folks, it makes me sick that these people serve as examples of hypocrites mm -hmm. and bigots who don't mind burden binding, amen, putting burdens upon others that they themselves will not touch with a thousand foot pole. The last example I have today is rather interesting. The evangelist Donnie Swaggart, son of the great Jimmy Swaggart. Uh, Jimmy Swaggart is his negative toward gay lesbian people as any preacher could possibly be. And yet, his son has been married three times, listen to this now, and divorced twice. But after his second divorce, he remarried his first wife. Good God, people, I'm telling you, there's as much junk going on in the church as there is in the world. And I mean to tell you, isn't it funny that people in the church can just sit so smugly and they can put requirements. Well, you can be gay. You can have gay thoughts all you want to, but just don't act on it. Nobody's turning to the divorced person and saying, hey, according to the word of God, if you were to get involved with someone new, you'd be committing adultery. And therefore, you're going to have to do the same as a gay person to remain unmarried. When I was a young man, I married. I've told this story before. I married a girl who was, as it turns out, was so naive and, and, and backwards as, as anything could possibly be. I was all of 20. She was 18. And if her mother told her to jump, this girl said, how high? There was nothing, I kid you not, there was nothing her mother could tell her to do that this girl wouldn't do. And I'm going to share today, I'm, her, her mother did not marriage, and so is her dad, so there, there's no shame in me saying what I'm going to say. But I'm going to tell you a little secret. 
This girl was terrified of intimacy. So when we married, she, she was terrified of intimacy. Well, I had certain issues I've been dealing with ever since I was young. So I wasn't really in a big hurry. It didn't really bother me too bad. I was okay with it. I was very patient about it. And one night, her mother called me to uh, the doorway of her bedroom, her meaning the mother's bedroom. Now listen to this. Her father and her mother didn't share a bedroom. Her, her father and mother hadn't shared a bedroom in over a decade. Her father actually slept in the den, and she had the bedroom to herself. They, they had a very whacked out marriage. It was in bad shape. Here I was just a kid, and her mother called me one day, and I went to the doorway of the mother's bedroom, and there she stood in a negligee with her breasts, literally, folks, just, just about burgeoning and hanging out talking to me about how sweet it was that I was so patient with her daughter and she understood how hard that must be for me and blah, 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 okay? Now, it doesn't take, you know, a rocket scientist. You don't have to be super brainy to understand what was going on. I will tell you, at the time, I was about as stupid as a brick. Um, you know, I didn't altogether catch what was going on right away. It took me a little bit. But I just, you know, didn't act on it. I didn't pursue it. I wasn't interested in the least. And so it was not two days later that I woke up to find the girl I married had been taken from the house. She was gone without explanation, without note, without anything. When I went out, we were we were still. I was pastoring my second church at the time. Uh, we had started to work, and it was doing very very well. And I went out and spoke to her dad because we were trying to find our own place. But we were staying with her parents, you know, after the wedding, just till we could get a place in the community where we were pastoring. Went out to her dad and I said, well, where's she at? I don't even want to say her name, but I said, you know, where's she at? He said, well, wait till her mother comes home. And I thought to myself, why in the world would I need to wait until her mother comes home to find out where she is? You know, what does that have to do with anything? Long story short, her mother come home, let me know I need to get out of their house, that they were going to file for a divorce that she wasn't ready to be married and they had made a mistake in letting their daughter marry me because their daughter wasn't ready for marriage and blah, blah, blah. Well, in many ways, honestly, she was right. Long story short, a few months later, I was legally divorced. Now, I never in a million, trillion, billion years thought that would ever happen to me. I never in the universe, and we were only married 30 days, folks. We were not married for years. We, were, we had never had any kind of sexual encounter of any kind. Nothing. That marriage could easily have been annulled, but this mother was trying to make a point. Okay, she was getting revenge on me for that little encounter we had a couple days earlier, all right? And so it wound up going, and, and being young and inexperienced and not knowing anything, I didn't have enough sense to know. I, I didn't know nothing about hiring a lawyer or doing anything, you know? I didn't know anything, so I just let them do. I didn't want a divorce. I didn't get married to get a divorce, okay? I literally, because I understand the Word of God, I literally believed that I was going to have to live the rest of my life single now because legally I was divorced, even though my marriage had never been consummated. I still believe because the denomination I was in viewed it that way, and I was, I was pickled. I was in a real mess because of this situation. And I went through depression, I became suicidal, I really went through hell on wheels emotionally for a period of time because of this experience. I believed that under the circumstances, here I was called to preach, trying to do what God had called me to do, was pastoring my second church when all this transpired. The girl I married's aunt and cousins and some of her family members attended my church that I had started, and they kept attending. They didn't stop. 
And they told me, they said, Chuck, we understand what's going on. You know, we understand. Believe me, we understand. First of all, they knew their sister, their aunt, you know, what have you. And secondly, they, they understood Stacy just was, Jesus, I said the name, just was not, you know, ready to be married and, you know, what have you. And uh, so anyway, I went through hell on wheels with all. And I understand a lot of these people I'm talking about today may very well have been hit in the eyes with the same exact type of situation. So I am not standing in judgment of them. I'm not criticizing them. But what I am saying is we ought to be humbled by experiences like this in our own lives. Jimmy Swagger went through an experience where he clearly was having extramarital sexual encounters with another woman and it was international news and yet for all of that he still was never humbled by that experience. He still feels justified in pontificating and standing in judgment and placing burdens upon others which he himself clearly could not bear. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you something, believer. You and I can become like that ourselves if we're not careful. You and I can look at others and we can place burdens on them which we ourselves are not capable or willing to bear. We must be careful that we not give in to the temptation and do this way. In Matthew 19, verses 3 through 9, Listen, the Pharisees also came unto him, Jesus, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful, listen carefully, for a man to put away his wife for every cause, meaning for any reason? And he, Jesus, answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Listen, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you or allowed you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication. Remember, the original question they asked him was, Is it lawful for a man to put his wife away for any reason? For any reason he chooses. So now the Lord says, But I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication or adultery. And shall marry another committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Divorce and remarriage is not permissible even from the voice of Jesus. Even from the mouth of Jesus. You know what cracks me up? The very passage of scripture that people who oppose gay marriage, the very passage of scripture they love to quote and say, Jesus said marriage was between a man and a woman. That very passage they're quoting was actually Jesus not addressing the nature of marriage, but he was talking about divorce mm. had his comments had nothing to do he wasn't trying to define marriage he was trying to explain the conditions under which divorce was permissible if at all he explained that the only time divorce was permissible was under a, a situation where adultery was involved. That is the only, according to Jesus, that is the only legitimate 
purpose for a divorce. But, just because your divorce is legitimate, again, you have to remember, according to the teaching of God, and I'm not going exhaustively into this today, because it would take all day. There's quite a lot of scripture on this topic. But, again, divorce, period, is not recognized in heaven, folks. According to the teaching of the Apostle Paul, according to the teaching of the New Testament, the New Testament, not the Old Testament law, the New Testament, according to the teaching of the Apostle Paul, once you are divorced, you are still married in the eyes of God to that spouse. You're allowed to no longer have to support them. You're allowed to no longer have to live with them. And they are no longer your responsibility to care for and you know what have you however Paul said remarriage is not permissible so long as that spouse remains alive as long as they're living God still sees them as your spouse divorce or no divorce say pastor why are you saying this are you trying to condemn these preachers who have been divorced or married no no no, I'm trying to say they're human. I'm trying to say that there are times when you've got to do what you've got to do because humanly you are not capable of doing otherwise. Hello now. You can't live alone. You can't be alone. You can't, you know, you have a desperate need for companionship. You have a need for intimacy. These things are part of the human experience. God understands that. Thank God for grace. Thank God that we're no longer under the law, but we're under grace. Hallelujah. Amen. Mm -hmm. But honey, don't you dare try to put me under the law while you claim grace for yourself. It doesn't work that way. Right. If grace doesn't work for everybody, grace don't work for nobody. Amen. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. Listen to this. In Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible, I think I'm going a little bit over time today. I apologize. In, so in Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible, according to their Greek dictionary, the word that is translated in the King James text as fornication, as it appears in Acts 15 and verse 20, literally means, listen to me, as part of its definition, it means, quote, sexual intercourse, listen, with a divorced man or woman. So the New Testament word translated fornication by the King James translators includes as an act of fornication, sexual intercourse with a divorced man or woman. Oh my goodness. You don't hear that when you hear preachers preaching about fornication, do you? No, not at all. But they'll tell the gay lesbian person, you've just got to deny your sexuality. You have to deny your need for companionship. You have to deny your need for intimacy. You've got to live celibate your whole life if you're going to please God and make heaven. Hello now. But do they apply that same standard to themselves? Do they apply that same standard even to the heterosexual members of their congregation? Why, of course not. Because God knows that the rules of God apply differently to different people. According, you know, the Bible was written with this group of people being required to follow these rules. And this group of people, no, it was not. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? I hope this ought to encourage a lot of people who feel like they're preached into hell and they can't be honestly who they are and they cannot be honest with themselves and with God and still serve the Lord and make heaven. This message should be good news for you this afternoon, folks. In 2 Corinthians verse 6 and 9, the Apostle Paul writes, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, listen, neither fornicators, that word we're just talking about, that includes in, this, in its definition, sexual intercourse with a divorced man or woman. 
neither fornicators, nor idolaters, meaning worshipers of idols, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. You see, it's interesting because if you notice, fornicator does not include adulterers. Adultery and fornication don't fall under the same heading in this passage. No, because those who have sex with a divorced person is not necessarily the same as someone who has sex with someone who's married. Do you follow what I'm saying? He's separating those two actions. He's separating having sexual intercourse with someone who is divorced versus having sexual intercourse with someone who is presently married. Do you follow what I'm saying? I want to tell you today, isn't it funny how people will rewrite the Word of God? Oh, they'll redefine all kinds of issues. Now, the Southern Baptist Convention in 2020, the Southern Baptist Church that Charles Stanley pastored said, yes, you can remain our pastor so long as you do not remarry. So isn't it interesting that even the Southern Baptist Convention that loves to come down heavy on the head of LGBT people, even they understand clearly what the Word of God says concerning divorce and remarriage. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Folks, I want to tell you today in Acts 15 and verse 20, the Word of God tells us uh, the apostles had come together in Jerusalem. They were addressing the issue. What ought we tell Gentile believers concerning the law? Are there any rules, are there any mandates in the law of Moses that they ought to concern themselves with? And they determined just a few things. And, they, and this was the answer that was given to the Gentiles. Uh, that was arrived at by the apostles. They said, but that we write unto them, meaning unto the Gentile believers, that they abstain from pollutions of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. Included in that term fornication is sexual intercourse with a divorced person. So those who say, oh, but that was the law, that doesn't apply today. Oh, but it does. But thank God for grace. Mm -hmm. The Lord never puts more upon us than that which we are able to bear. Unlike the Lord, however, many so-called Christians love exacting a price from their neighbor, which they themselves are not willing to pay. They're happy to bind a burden upon their brother, which they themselves would not carry for one moment. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the Word of God said, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. God is not in the habit of putting more on us than we're able to bear. God does not expect you to change something you cannot change. God does not expect you to be something that you are not or to do something you cannot do. Hello now. Mm -hmm. If it were something that God expected you to be able to change, He would make that change available to you. Right. If it were something that God required you not to do, He would make a way for you not to have to do it. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Any of us who have been through this struggle know how many of us prayed and fasted for years and years and years and years that God would change us, change us, change us, change us. Lord, oh God, please change us. Even the Apostle Paul said, he sought the Lord three times. Lord, remove this thing from me that he identified as a demon, a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. And the answer came back, no, Paul, my grace is sufficient 
for you. Glory to God. When there is something in your life, whether you want to call it sin or don't want to call it sin, whether it is identified in the Word of God as sin or not, folks, the bottom line is this. God's grace is sufficient for you. Amen. That's why you've got to maintain your faith. That's why you've got to keep your covering held on to you. Hold on to Jesus and don't let him go. Because he is your righteousness. He is your covering. He is going to be your ticket to perfection one day. Glory to God. Amen. In Matthew 7, verse 12, the Word of God declares, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. If we approached our living for God according to the mandate of God's Word, and we didn't try to put nothing on anybody else that we wouldn't want put on us. Hello now. Mm -hmm. How much better would the church be? How much grief and despair and depression would be avoided in the lives of God's people? How much more could we experience victory and joy and peace and living for the Lord? If people simply did not try to bind a burden mm -hmm. to their neighbor that they themselves are unwilling or unable to carry. The Lord tells us to treat others as we would like to be treated. If we would not wish to be bound by so great a burden, we have no business placing such a burden upon someone else. Amen. But the promise of the gospel from the lips of the Lord himself is not a grievous burden, not a struggle to be born, but rather the promise of the gospel is rest. You do not have to earn your salvation or work to achieve eternal life. These things are afforded us freely by the grace of God in response to our faith. Hallelujah. Closing today in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, the Lord Jesus Christ declares, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Boy, I'm going to tell you, I lived for the Lord many years of my life, and I had anything but rest. I felt like I was carrying a burden that I couldn't handle, that I couldn't possibly carry. That's not what God's called us to. That is not the promise of the gospel. The promise of the gospel is rest. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. And learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Hallelujah. Oh, children, I want to tell you today, there are a lot of burden-binding bigots in the church today. There are a lot of burden-binding bigots in the world today. We can't afford to become one of them. That's right. And we are as much in danger of doing so as anyone. Mm -hmm. We must be careful not to look at our neighbor and try to place some expectation upon them, which we ourselves are not able or willing to live up to. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. Amen. Praise God. If you stand with me this afternoon.